So one of the things that um, you may have seen in the catalog or not is that I've uh, been making games for a long time. I started in the industry in 1990 at Electronic Arts. And for the last 11 years of my career at Electronic Arts, I worked on The Sims, from the original game through Sims 2 and all of the, the various expansion paths, et cetera, and left Electronic Arts as the GM of The Sims Studio. And a couple years ago, I made the decision to move to Zynga. And that was really prompted by an experience I had in my house, which was I'm a lifelong gamer, play games my entire life. Um, but you know what, my wife didn't. My wife didn't play games with me and games were the thing that I did and she didn't. Um, and then all of a sudden one day I realized that sitting on her laptop, she was playing a game daily. And I was still playing WoW then and I had my Tuesday night guild runs which for a period of time were uh, a source of frustration for her. And then all of a sudden they weren't any longer because she was playing Farmville on a daily basis, uh, in some cases a couple hours a day and certainly several times a day. And she would never describe herself as a gamer, but she was gaming every day. And I thought, you know, like a lot of people coming from the traditional space, it felt like a fad, like, oh, this won't last. These aren't, these aren't real games. This doesn't feel like a real game. Um, and then when Cityville came out, uh, and I had, spent, I had spent 10 years of my life making The Sims, and over that, over that time, had touched about 100 million players, and then Cityville in the course of like a month and a half had touched that same number of players, I thought, okay, this is not a fad, this is something very different, and I really wanted to understand how it worked. And that was how I chose to make the leap to social and free to play and join Zynga. And so today, I'm just gonna tell you some of the things that I've learned uh, via that choice. And they're not profound, They're, a lot of them are really common sense, but hopefully I can at least share the things that I've learned that seem to be the foundation of being successful in the free-to-play space. Who knows what this is a picture of? Anybody? Nobody? <laughs> it's my prom night, no. So this is, uh, this is a shot of the Sistine Chapel. Um, this is... Uh, uh, a piece of work, artwork that Michelangelo did, and uh, it was, it's a big deal. Like, it's all over the roof of the Sistine Chapel. Um, and if you go to Italy, you can see it. The real point here is that we consider this art, we consider this fine art, we consider this important art. Um, the reality is this is commercial art. Michelangelo was paid to paint this thing, right? This is a purpose-driven work that was, he was compensated for. It's not dissimilar to what we do. Though we may love games and we may love making games, this is a business, it's a commercial effort, and what we create is commercial art. And sometimes we can get lost in the sense of games is art, games is art, games is art, but most of us get a paycheck for what we do, and therefore we are beholden to the people who pay our paycheck to create products that can drive a business. It doesn't mean that we don't want to make fun games and things like that, but you really have to recognize that what we do is we create commercial art. I'm sure if Michelangelo had his preference, this would have been an epic battle scene of orcs and elves or maybe humans and zombies, but the reality is, is he was painting this for the church and so therefore he had to paint biblical scenes. Um, and so much of what we have to think about in our business, um, in the art that we create, the commercial art that we create is, what is the opportunity for this art? Why does it exist? Um, who is the audience we're building for? And do we have the capability to deliver on those two? Can we make the product that fits the opportunity in the audience? And those are the things that I want you to keep in the back of your mind as I talk today. Um, what is the real difference between traditional games and free to play? Everybody know what these two games are? Anybody not know what these two games are? Okay, good. Everybody, know, nobody, everybody knows. Okay, good. Um, so these are both match three games. One of the most venerable mechanics in gaming and certainly in casual gaming. What is the real difference between these two games? There are many feature differences, obviously. But the real difference is, is that one of them you pay before you play and the other you don't. It's a really simple equation, but in that simplicity, really, there is a tremendous amount of complexity. 
Um, one is not better than the other. I'm not up here to tell you free to play is better than a traditional game that you pay for up front. Um, but the key difference is the cost of entry. And if you think about it, it's not dissimilar to movies versus television. So I'm going to ask another question, show of hands. Somebody, you know, please raise your hand. Um, how many of you, maybe not in this question, how many of you have walked out of a movie in the first 15 minutes? Wow, that's quite a few. Did you pay for the ticket? OK, so you paid for the ticket. Did you work, walk out in the first five minutes? OK, you didn't work, walk out in the first five minutes. That's good. OK, how many of you have clicked off of a television show in the first 30 seconds to a minute? Come on, everybody's got to raise their hand on that one, right? Well, there's a, there's a cost of entry, right? You've bought a movie ticket. There is friction that goes along with making that purchase. You've probably been marketed to and told that there is huge entertainment value in this thing that you're going to go see, this movie you're going to go see. Same goes for box product hey, there's huge anticipation and marketing that goes into buying this, especially in the video game industry, a $60 package. Well, you're not going to walk away from that in a couple minutes. You really want to find the entertainment value, even if you find that you don't love it when you first come into it. Free to play is completely different. People can switch off just like that. It's kind of like having a remote control in your hand. And so for us, in making free to play, we really need to think about how are we grabbing people right up front. And then the difference between this sort of square box that you pay for and you're done is we create this really long skinny box and we want to keep people coming back over and over and over again because that's how we're eventually going to make money in free to play. There's no cost to entry. There's actually no cost ever in most free to play games. And so the only way that you're probably going to recognize any sort of profit is by keeping people in the game and creating systems that encourage people to pay as they go. So the real difference between traditional and free to play is that you pay for the entertainment as you go and it's completely at your option. So you have to create models that really encourage people to help monetize your commercial art. It's still art, these are still games, they have to be fun, they have to be engaging, but you have to find ways to get people to pay you for the work that you've done. So now I'm just gonna pop into some lessons learned. These are the things that I've sort of learned that are really the differences um, between the traditional space and free to play. They're lessons that maybe you already know. I don't think I'm gonna tell you anything that seems incredibly profound. It's just stuff that I've learned and I'm a very common sense kind of guy. It's the way they approach game development. Um, and I hope that you can take something away from these. So the first is, whether you like it or not, the future is going to be here before you know it, especially in this space. Um, as I just described, this is a long, skinny box, right? It's going to last a long time. You need to know not only what that initial experience is, but what is the experience that you're going to deliver six months from now, a year from now, two years from now. Farmville, the original, just had its fourth birthday. I guarantee you that when Farmville was created, there wasn't an intent that it was going to be around for four years. And there have been a lot of choices that have been made in Farmville where you say, hey, this is Farmville, come see the game. And then you come to it and there's cows in you know, outer space outfits and all of these sort of things. And they represent all of these changes that have occurred over the course of the lifetime of the game. In many ways, coming to that game as Farmville and seeing it today, you're kind of like, this is a farming game? I don't quite get it. Well, there was no way to really anticipate that there was going to be a four-year lifespan for that game. But we know that now. We know that looking at many of the free-to-play games is that they have really long lifespans. If you do it right and you build a success, it's a game that's going to be around for a while. And so I really encourage you to have a long-term creative vision for your game up front. Understand where you want it to go, where you see the future, how you want to plan for it, and really design and build to that before you, not, not create, not do the actual development work, but certainly have a plan that says, this is how my game will change over time so that you're not surprised and you're not surprising your players as you add and continue to refine and curate the experience. To kind of illustrate that, I want to uh, bring this family up on screen. Um, how many people know who this family is? Wow, that's actually more than I thought. Uh, 
These are the Cunninghams. This is the cast of Happy Days. Um, and uh, this, was their, this was the initial season. There was Howard and Marion who were the parents, and then they had three children, Joni, Richie, and this guy up in the right-hand corner is Chuck. He actually didn't make it past the first season, so he was kind of a product of tuning, apparently. Um, and then there were Richie's friends. There was uh, Ralph Mouth and, and Potsy. And then there was the kind of uh, neighborhood tough guy, but lovable tough guy, Fonzie. And they were really the center of this hugely popular and successful sitcom. The reason I bring them up is that many of you may know this show, not for the Cunninghams, not for the success it had, but for a phrase that was actually born out of this show, which you probably have no idea came from this show. Does anyone know what this is a picture of? Exactly. So Happy Days is known more for many people today by the phrase that was generated by this particular episode than the show itself. And the reason Jump the Shark came to be is that this was the beginning of the fifth season of Happy Days. And much like having a long-term creative vision, there was this big event. The, the entire cast went to California. I'm not sure how a family plus assorted people from their neighborhood and such all go to California together, but that's what happened on Happy Days. It was the opening of the fifth season. They did a big promotion. It was a three-episode arc. It all culminated with Fonzie taking a challenge to jump over this great white shark that had been penned up in this bay. Now, it's unlikely that the shark would have survived being penned up. It wouldn't have even been in the bay in the first place. But anyway, <laughs> Fonzie took the challenge to jump over the shark. And so, hence, we now have the phrase, jump the shark. Now, I'm challenging that this maybe wasn't uh, this was a product of not having a long-term creative vision for the game or a long arc or the show or a long arc uh, in terms of where they wanted the series to go over time because maybe they couldn't project the success that they were going to have. Now it's also possible that it was completely projected because this is also the show that brought you Mork from Ork, who was an alien who visited the people in the 50s and that sprung uh, Robin Williams' career with Mork and Mindy. So, so maybe this was all part of their plan. but. All I'm encouraging you guys to have is a long-term vision because if your game is successful, it is likely gonna be around a long time and I don't want you to jump the shark. For Farm 2, the way that we approached that is we started with some creative pillars for the game. The first one was your farm is alive. This meant to us that the game was really responsive to you. Um, crops would sway as you moved your finger across them. The animals would react when you touched them. That, that the entire board just felt like it came to life at your fingers. Farm is a game about nurturing. It's about taking care of and nurturing a farm. And so we wanted to make sure that that was how people felt, that this was really almost like a little Tamagotchi, but it was a farm that you had to take care of. We also had a plan that your farm was an ecosystem. Everything that you did mattered. So everything you grew, your crops, everything tied back together. So the crops would feed the animals, the animals would produce fertilizer, you could take the animal products and the crops and, and craft, and that it created this cycle where the, the farm kind of fed itself. And then finally, it's really important to us, we make social games at Zynga, that you were part of a living community. We really wanted you to feel like your friends were on the board with you and that as you did things, you saw your friends, you could interact with your friends, and that you felt like your farm was part of a much larger farming community. These things were really important to us in terms of being creative pillars because they came, became razors for us to make decisions about any of the features that went into the game. Um, it also provided the team with a measurement that they could look at the features that they were planning and understand whether they supported the long-term creative vision. This is really the heart of the vision, but we also had something that said, here is our overall design. This is where we want to get to in the future. And what I'm going to talk about now is the idea of onion skin development. So onion skin development is really about, just like an onion is created by concentric circles of skin, 
think about the core or the center first and then have a plan for the ongoing concentric circles. This works really well in free to play when you're designing for this long skinny box, which is you're not gonna deliver all of the game up front. It's actually not prudent because you don't know if people are gonna get to the end of it. So what you've gotta do is deliver enough entertainment up front that people get hooked and wanna play and then have a plan for consecutively releasing new installments of content. And so you wanna have that long-term content plan. With the onion skin model, you build the core first. In the case of Farmville 2, that core for us was crops, animals, and crafting, and that was the game that we released. Now, we're almost a year into the life of Farm 2, and um, since then, we have released the next concentric circle, which is the county fair. This was a plan for, our, for our, uh, ours from the beginning, which was to add a competition layer to the game, but we didn't launch with that. We had a plan that it would come in the future. And we have many more things planned over the life of Farmville 2. But all of those things have actually been thought about and we have a plan and a roadmap on the wall that shows what two years in looks like, what three years in can look like. And so, you know, all of this is really just driving back to the, the point that I want you guys to take away, which is you are designing for a long skinny box. Really understand what that box is and have a plan for your product so that you don't jump the shark. So the second lesson I've learned, it's the economy, stupid. And what do I mean by that? I mean that the most important thing to drive success and free to play is to have a tight economy in your game. It's just vital. Um, because tuning is gonna make you or break you. Sorry, I'm trying to get my notes as they fly away. Um, As you think about your game, tuning and in this space is incredibly important. If it's too hard, you might lose people up front. If it's too easy, you might lose people up front. If it's too complex, you might lose people up front. You don't wanna lose people up front. Remember, we only make money if they stick around. Nobody is paying us up front to experience our game. The most commitment we get out of them is that they download it. Um, and in many cases, whether it's mobile or in the social space, that's not a very long period of time. And so, so you have to think about how am I bringing people into this experience, how do I hold them in the experience, and how do I keep them coming back day after day? These are just some things to think about. Sessions per day. How many times do you want people to play? You could argue that in mobile, having somebody come to your game 10 to 12 times a day is huge, even if they're only coming in for 15 seconds, because it means the game is top of mind. Think about what you want to do while you're standing in line in Starbucks. Do you want somebody to check Facebook, read their email? Wouldn't you rather have them pop into your game? Well, if you do want them to pop in your game, you better have an entertainment value that they can achieve within 15 seconds. It's got to be productive for them to pop into the game. But thinking about how many times you want somebody to come to your game and tuning for that is really important. Session length, how long do you want somebody to play? Just as I said, should I be able to play and be entertained while I'm standing in line at Starbucks? But also, what does that mean? We're out of time. Already? I thought, okay. Well then I'll go quick. Here's a bunch of other things. Session length, virtuous consumption model. Compulsion models, so why would players be willing uh, to continue, you know, what, what are they willing to pay for? Um, strategy, grind, and luck, how are those balanced? Iteration versus automation, so how do you iterate, how do you build for that iteration and automate that? I thought I had 20 minutes. Oh, oh we, we didn't start at 10 then, did we? Oh, did we? Okay, well then, hey, also make sure that you uh, incorporate social because friends are your friends and base the power of social obligation and consumption. I created a language for social because sometimes social is, becomes viral and we talk about it as viral, so I created a language for social. The level one of that is awareness, it's just people, you're aware that people are playing with you. Level two is togetherness um, and this is that friends make the game better for you and vice versa. Commitment, words with friends, you can't play with words with friends without another friend to play. And then finally, community, and community is, what I talk about here is this is word of mouth. So if you can drive people to talk about your game outside the game, you win. 
especially in the mobile space, getting people to share the game and tell others about it is vital. The most important lesson I've learned, and I'll just pop to this, which is the what of what we do is really easy. It's really easy to tell people that we make games. What's really hard is to tell them why we do it, who we do it for, and how we do it. And those are the things that you need to focus on, because those are the questions you're going to ask throughout development um, of your game. And they really are the things that drive the outcome of the what. And you'd be surprised how many times people forget to ask about the why, the who, and the how of what we do. Thanks. Thank you.